after sweet victory Oh, there's no sound louder than the captive set free There's no sound, there's no sound louder than Have you been delivered this morning? You are my deliverer. Yeah, you're my deliverer. You are my deliverer. The freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer. You are my promised land. You are my deliverer. The freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer. Shelby Christian, it's good to have you guys uh, here today. As a reminder, after I finish praying, we have uh, six communion stations set out there with a double cup, so the bread and the juice are right there. And then there's the black offering boxes to continue in worship uh, through that way, if you want to drop your envelope off in there. So it's February, so that's the, the month of love and, you know, the made-up Valentine's Day holiday, but you won't see, you know, the Dove family bowing down to big flower or big candy, right, you know, but it's also the month that they usually talk about relationships over in the stew uh, where the, the youth meet. So last week I, I snuck over there uh, to hear Ray uh, and his new series on purple, which is their, their relationship series. Uh, as, a, as a complete side note, um, if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler or know a middle schooler or a high schooler, you got to get them over there, right, because they're doing some, some awesome things over there. There's worship, there's uh, games that they play, there's teaching times, there's small group. Um, so, so get them over there on Sunday evenings. It's, it's a great time. Have your kid challenge rate a ping pong. It'll be an easy win for them, right? You know, but um, anyway, so uh, in, the, in the relationship thing, this, that, that week he talked about God's relationship with us, right? And, he, and God's love for, for us. And he talked about you know, God's love is patient and is kind. It doesn't keep record of wrongs and, and so on and so forth there. And, and all of that is, is so true, right? But I don't know where you guys have been or where you currently are in your life, but I know for me, there are times in my life that I didn't feel it. You know, you kind of know it's there, but you, you don't feel it. So Paul in Ephesians 3 says, don't be discouraged because of your sufferings. Because I know that Christ can dwell in your heart and rooted and established in God's love, right? Hopefully we'd have the power to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ. And that love is beyond our knowledge or comprehension. So as we come to this time, I want each and every one of you guys to know that God loves you so, so much. 
that I don't understand it, it's beyond my comprehension, but even though I didn't deserve it, he sent his son down to die on the cross for me. And he did the same for you. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for this day. I just thank you for the chance to worship you. We just humble ourselves. We hope this is pleasing to you, Lord. And I just come before you now. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his love. I thank you that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we will do, that you love us. So wide, so deep, so high, so long, there's nothing that we can do where you're not here for us, Lord. Help us to honor you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. You're in this place, God. Let our hearts be open. Let our minds be open to what you have in store for us, Lord. 
Father, let us never give up on you. Never give up on you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. You can be seated. I, uh, I know that every time we sing that song, that there are some, some of you guys singing that song, and you're like, yeah, I've seen that breakthrough. I've, I've, I've experienced that breakthrough. And yet I know that there are others sitting here this morning that are like, you're, you're waiting, right? You're holding on to that, that belief that there's going to be a breakthrough. You're, you're in the middle of something right now, and you're like, God, I'm just, I'm going to try to hold on for another day or for another week or for another season. I'm waiting for that breakthrough. And I want you to know that if that's you, uh, that, that I'm praying for you and that you would see that uh, that, that real God move in your life. Hey, thanks for being here uh, today. We are in week five of this series. We're walking through uh, two chapters in Revelation, Revelation chapter two and chapter three. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and grab those, get open. We're going to be actually in chapter three this week. And what we're looking at are some letters. Jesus wrote um, seven different letters to seven different churches. And they're just short. Uh, they could be on a postcard. Uh, some of them could almost fit in a tweet, not quite, but a couple of tweets. So they're really, they're really short. The one I'm going to uh, read today, and we're going to walk through today, is six verses. It's about 13 sentences, so it's pretty short. Uh, and what Jesus did was he, he, set, uh, he set John down, and he, he gave him this revelation. He gave him this dream. He said, hey, write these things down. And then he, uh, John is, is in exile. He's on an island called Patmos. And he says, send these to the seven churches, and I, want, I have a clear message I want to give them, and I want you to deliver this message. And so these words that we're going to read this morning to the church at Sardis, uh, that's the, the church we're going to look at this morning, the city we're going to look at this morning. These are, these are Jesus's specific words to this church, okay? And we're calling this series up to us because what we've said is when we look at this, there are things that we can kind of pick from it, that we can learn from it, that we can kind of glean from it. And, and hopefully it'll help us as a church and as individuals here in Shelbyville, Kentucky in 2023. But first, let's kind of get our bearings on where, where we are, okay? We talked about Ephesus, we talked about Smyrna, we talked about some other, other cities. Uh, today, Sardis is kind of a little bit more central in the middle of this area. So this is modern day Turkey, okay? And so you can kind of see where these seven churches were or are. Uh, we're going to, like I said, talk about Sardis. It doesn't exist today. There's some ruins there. They're actually still excavating some of the, the ruins of Sardis. There's a, there's a little town next to it called Sart, uh, but Sardis doesn't exist anymore, unlike uh, Smyrna that I preached about a few weeks ago. So it's actually still a city uh, in Turkey. And so here's, let me give you a little bit of background on who these people were, okay? The city of, of Sardis was a pretty fascinating place. They, they, they built the city on top of this mountain, so about 1,500 feet up above the valley floor, the Hermes River flowed. And so they built this city on, a, on, a, on top of a, a mountain. And what they did was they recognized that there, you'll see some pictures here in a second. There, there were these cliffs all around the, the city. And we'll, we'll go ahead and look at those pictures. I'll show you. So, so you can kind of see uh, this is some of the ruins still that remain there today. And so there's these sharp right? Cliffs. And it was on top of this, there's this one picture. Yeah, actually this one. There's this little hole, kind of like the entrance. There was really only one small way into this city. And so what they thought once they built the city and they walled it up and they said, well, there are these sharp cliffs on all sides and we're up here on top of this. Like they thought they were impenetrable, right? They, they thought they were untouchable. They thought that there's no way anyone can get to us. Like we're, we're good. And so what happens with, and it was a, it was a wealthy city. They were known for their jewelry and their gold, uh, their textile industry was incredible. They built beautiful carpet uh, in the first century. They, um, they had this spring in the middle of the, of the town so that there was a fresh water would come and they didn't have to go searching for that, right? That would be a luxury. And so they called this, this fresh water spring, they called it the, the God of the underworld, right? And so that was like what they called this, this well. And in, in, in this city, like many of the cities we're, we're talking about and, and the reason why Paul went and planted these churches, uh, in the first place, was because they were full of just pagan worship, right? Just horrible, um, graphic, detestable, depraved people. And Sardis was no different. They worshiped the goddess 
Artemis. And you might remember, if you studied Greek mythology in school, Artemis or, or Sibylle, I think is how, how you pronounce it, like this, this goddess, and she was a goddess of, she, she represented nature and fertility. And one of the things that they would do every year, they would have this festival to this goddess Artemis. Uh, there's actually some ruins still there today. You could go and see the, the temple ruins of Artemis there uh, in this place. They, they would have this festival every year. And during this festival, um, I, I, I studied this a little bit this week. I was like, how do you even, I can't even say some of the things that they did at this festival because it's like, it's not even, I would blush. <laughs> I, I would just say this. You guys know Mardi Gras? Right? Like, the things that they would do at this festival will make Mardi Gras look like a church picnic. Okay? Right? And it was like all, like, no holds barred with whoever, whenever, whatever. You get, get my drift? Like, like there was, it, it's just this pagan thing that's going on. And this was the center, this was at the heart of this city. And that's who they were. And, and so this is what's going on there when Paul plants this church, when John writes this letter that Jesus gave him these words to, to remember. But there is a group of people there. There's a, a church that has been established there. The city itself, uh, uh, very much like the church, began to have this uh, thought. Well, we're up here. There's no one that can touch us. A couple times Sardis was attacked by enemies, but they would recover from that. But they thought, you know what? We're, we're good. And so what happens is they start to kind of just get complacent. They kind of just start to let their guard down. They say, you know what? There's really nothing. We've got everything. We've got water. we got all the stuff. We're wealthy. We're doing good. Like, we're having a good time worshiping Artemis. Like, everything's good for us. And so we're just going to kind of go on with life. And so then this church comes in. These followers of Jesus are planted there in this church. And Jesus wants to write them this letter to just communicate with them and, and share some things with them that are on his heart. And so I want you to look at this letter. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. Here's what Jesus says. He says, Write this letter to the angels of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold Spirit of God and the seven stars. Now, you, you may know that the, the number seven is important in the Bible. Seven just means, it means wholeness or completeness. So anytime you see the number seven, like seven days of the week, right? Like it's, it's complete, it's whole. And what Jesus is saying here is, is that he is writing this message. This is the complete, he's talking about uh, the sevenfold spirit, the Holy Spirit, the complete spirit or the Holy Spirit there, the seven stars. He's talking about the elders, the leaders of the church. And what he's saying is he's in control of this. He's kind of establishing like he does with all of his other letters. Hey, the authority with which I write this letter I'm the one that's in charge. I, the, my Holy Spirit ha, is in your church, your, your leaders, your elders. I'm directing them. I have them. They are mine. And so this is the first thing that Jesus does. He says that, that he is the sovereign God working in this church. His Holy Spirit is there, and he's in control. Now, here's what's interesting about these letters. In the past uh, letters that we've kind of looked at over the last few weeks, Jesus, Jesus would say something encouraging at the very beginning. He would say something encouraging, and then he'd kind of drop the hammer on them, right? He'd kind of like lift them up a little bit, and they'd say, there's good news, bad news. I got some good news for you, I got some bad news. Well, he doesn't really do that with Sardis. In a minute, he'll talk about a, a, a little bit glimmer of, of some good news, but he comes in hot and heavy with these guys. Look at what he says here next in the, in the, in the next part of this verse. He says, I know, and, and this is interesting too, if you study these letters, look at these letters. Jesus says this in all seven of the letters, all seven of the churches. He says, I know. I know all the things. I, I know what, what's going on. I see, I observe, I'm there, I know. All right? And it's like, whoa, Jesus, like, you, he's reaffirming this, like, his spirit is there. He is there. He's, he's watching. He's knowing. He, I know all the things you do. And, and he says, and, and that you have a reputation for being alive. Right? You have this reputation in the community for being a certain thing. But, what does it say? You are dead. Jesus is looking at this church in Sardis, and he says, I know you got this reputation. I know you think you're one thing. He says, but you are dead. And then look what he says next. Wake up! Imagine Jesus coming to you and, and, and saying to you, like, wake up! 
right? You need to wake up. That's exactly what he's doing to this church. And he says, strengthen what little remains for even what is left in this church. What is, what is left? Even the little that is left is almost dead. Jesus was saying that this church is in real danger. He's saying, you may look like you're doing well on the outside, but you're barely hanging on. He's saying, you're on life support, right? You need to be resuscitated. You need to be woken up. You are just hanging on by a thread. It's almost over. Church, you're almost dead. It, it, it's it's going to cease to exist, and you need to wake up. I picture Jesus standing at the bedside of this church, right? Just shaking the bed, right? They're on their, they're on their deathbed, and he's shaking the bed. Well, you need to wake up before it's too late. And that's the situation that the church at Sardis finds itself in. I love this quote from, from John MacArthur. Look at this quote. It says, a church is dying when there is content to rest on its past laurels, when it's more concerned with liturgical forms than spiritual realities, when it focuses on curing social ills more than changing people's hearts through the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it's more concerned with material than spiritual things, when it's more concerned with what men think than what God's Word says. When it's more enamored with the doctrine of creeds and the systems of theology than with the Word of God, or when it loses its conviction that every word of the Bible is the Word of God Himself, that is when a church dies. And what Jesus is saying to the church at Sardis is that you're almost dead. You need to wake up. It's almost over. Most churches, most churches don't die. Of, of a one specific thing most of the time. It, it's not one thing that causes a church to cease to exist. And I don't know if you know this or not, but churches close up every week in America. There are church, uh, new churches are, are born, new churches are planted, but churches all over America every week. There will be, there will be dozens, I don't, I don't know what the statistics are, but churches will close, today will be the last Sunday that some churches will ever meet in certain communities in our country and around the world. And so churches, they don't die usually of a specific thing. It's this gradual process. It's a slow fade away from God's vision for the church. It's the same process that, that we, most of us, experience in life, right? It's not fun to talk about, but, but, but your life, is like at the moment we're born, we start to die. And for most of us, if we're blessed with living a long, healthy life, it's this slow, gradual, right? You get up in the morning, you're like, oh, man, those bones and those joints and that body doesn't, that 50-year-old body doesn't feel like it did when it was 20, right? And, that's like, and it's like, whoa. These, these things start to, it's just this gradual thing, right, that happens with us physically. And the same thing can happen to a church. It's this gradual process, this slow fade into death. And so the church at Sardis had this great outward reputation. Jesus said, you guys have a great reputation in the community, but, but I know. I know what's going on. I know your hearts. I know what you're, what you're doing and what you're not doing and, and what you're about and what you're not about. You have this great outward reputation, but that doesn't line up with the inward reality. Uh, people may say things like this about that church. I mean, that, that church has a great history. Right? That's a great church. That, that church ha has a great name. They even have the name Christian in the name of the church. It must be a great church, right? That, that church has some great pastors. I love the pastors of that church. That church has a, a great worship leader and a great, their, their music is awesome. They have, they have great worship. That church has a lot of great activities, great programs and great events. You know, that church, they always seem to be doing a lot of things in the community. It's a great church. It seems to be a church that has a lot of things going on. And then Jesus comes along to the church at Sardis and he says, I know all the things that you do. And then look at what he says next in, in Revelation chapter or, or 3, 2. He says, imagine Jesus saying this to us, to you. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Whoa. All right, and Jesus is saying, look, I, like, you, you guys aren't cutting it. Like, you, you think you're like, these activities, the, the stuff that you're about, you think that's good enough? And Jesus says, it is not. There was a lot of activity within the church. They were maybe doing a lot of really good things outwardly. 
But the church had fallen into a routine. They, they were just kind of plain church. They, they kind of got in a rut. They, they kind of were just spinning their wheels, going about whatever it is, right? We do. We do this, and then we do this, and we go this, and we say this, and we act like this. They were just going through the motions. They were doing things that were expected that a church would do, but their motivations behind those deeds were not right. And Jesus is, these are Jesus' words. These deeds and these things didn't give, they gave them this reputation with people, but it was unacceptable behavior for the church in God's sight. John Stott wrote a book called What Christ Thinks of the Church. Look at this quote. He says, The distinction between what human beings see and what God sees is of great importance to every age. Although we have responsibilities to others, we primarily are accountable to God. It's before Him that we stand, and to Him that one day we must give an account. We should not, therefore, weigh human opinions too high, become depressed when criticized, or elated when flattered. We need to remember that the Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He reads our thoughts, he knows our motives, and he can see how much reality is behind our profession, how much life is behind our facade. And so what Jesus is saying to this church is that you put up a facade. You've, you've done things and you're acting in ways that may be self-serving, that may be self-seeking, that, that may be all about you, Right? And you've, you've pulled away, you've gradually walked away, faded away from what I intend, what my mission, what my goal is for you as a church. And so here's a question that I want to ask us this morning. What, what is the motivation? What's the motivation for why I do what I do? What's the motivation for why you are here today? Is it so others will look at you and go, oh, he's a good guy. He goes to church, right? All right? Is it, is it to help your business? <laughs> is it to help your political campaign? Is it to help your stature in the community? What's your motivation? Being a part of the church. Being a follower of Christ. Is it so you'll get pats on the back? Oh, yeah, he's a good guy. All right, what's our motivation? Well, what's, what's the next one? What is the motivation for us as a church, why, why do we do what we do? I think it's good for us as a church to continue to ask that question. Why are we doing this? Is this important? All right, what's the motivation behind this? Why are we doing the things that we're doing? And every day, is it, we need to ask that question. Is it for Him? Is it to bring Him glory? Or is it to bring ourselves some attention and some glory? Every day we should ask God to search our hearts. Search my heart, Lord. Show me if my attitude is wrong, if my motives are not your motives. And so Jesus goes on in verse 3 of Revelation. This is what He says to the church next. He says you need to go back. You need to go back to what you have heard and believed at first. Hold to that firmly. Jesus says you need, to, you need to remember. Remember what it was like in the beginning, right? You've slowly kind of just fallen away. You're numb to it now, right? You, you, you're just walking away, and you're almost dead, but you need to go back. You know what he's saying? He's saying you need to go back to the basics, you need to go back to the primary things that really matter. You need to remind yourself, church, of what, what, we're, what we're supposed to be about and why any of this matters. And so he says you need to get back to the basics. You need to get back to the foundational truths of God's Word. Those things that brought you to Christ in the first place. Those things that give you a foundation in, in Christ. Get back to them and hold on to those things. Now, basic... Basic doesn't mean superficial, right? Basic doesn't mean easy. Basic doesn't mean surface level. Basic's not the opposite of deeply spiritual. Basic is just like, hey, these are some of the, a few of the things that are undeniably true about Jesus. And he says you need to get back to those things. You need to remind yourself of what those things are. So let's look at, this is just a quick list that I came up this week in kind of preparation for this sermon. Look, here's some of the, the basics. The first thing that I hope we can all agree on, and that I hope you guys will, will agree with, and maybe even affirm with an amen, is that Jesus is God. 
right? So, okay, Jesus, you are God. Number one, we got that. All right, the second one. Here's another basic. Jesus was sent to earth by God the Father, right? This understanding of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit, right? The God said, Jesus, you got to go down there. There's some problems that are bigger than like, they, 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 their sin. They can't, do, they can't handle it. They, got, they need a Savior. And so God said, son, you got to go. And so Jesus was sent to earth by the Father. The next one. Jesus was crucified on the cross because of our sins. They killed an innocent man, the holy, blameless Son of God. He died on a cross because of your sins and because of my sins. Next. Jesus was placed in the tomb, and he walked out of said tomb on the third day. Amen? Right? Jesus, they put him in a tomb, and they thought that was the end of it. This is basic stuff, right? You guys have heard this, heard this, heard this set, set, taught and preached, and, and you read it hundreds of times, right? He walked out of, of that setting. But the next, Jesus gave us marching orders, and he gave us his Holy Spirit before he went back to be with the Father. He said, here's what you are to be about, and you don't go about this church alone. I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to guide you, to lead you, to be with you, to walk with you. My Holy Spirit, God gave us that in the form of his Holy Spirit. The next thing. Jesus is the only way to God the Father. There is no other way. Right? Tell, no, right here. Tell your friends to wake up. Right? There is only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus. Now, I know we live in a world that says there's a lot of other avenues and paths and, and things that can get you to God. But if we hold the Scripture and we understand what Jesus taught us, there is only one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus. And what we need to be about is sharing that message with as many people as we possibly can and telling them to wake up. Wake up, because there's only one way to get out of this place alive, and his name's Jesus. The next one. Jesus is coming back for his bride, the church. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? I do. I, I hope it's today, <laughs> right? I, 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 I hold on to that. Like Jesus is coming back. He promised us. Like he, he, he said it. He promised it. And he's never not come through in any of his promises. He said, I'm going to come back. I'm leaving to go back to the Father, but I'm going to come back one day for my church, for my bride, for you all. He made us that promise. A basic understanding of Scripture. And then the last one here. Jesus told us to get ready and to stay ready for His return. He told us to get ready. Get your house in order. And get everyone else's house in order that you love, that you care about. Tell them to wake up. Tell them to get ready because I'm coming back. And so here's the question. Are you ready? Are you ready? And is every person that you love that you care about, that you have a relationship with? Do you know if they're ready or not? Have you had a, have a, had a conversation with them? Like, if it ends today, if it ends tonight, if you get in a head-on collision and you cease to exist anymore on this earth, if you don't walk among us tomorrow, are you ready? And if you're not ready... And you better get ready. And so Jesus is saying to this church, you got to wake up. You got to get back to these basic understandings of who I am and what I've done and what I've taught you and, and what I am about. I hope that doesn't sound like superficial or elementary to you because it sounds like the most important truth that I've ever heard. And Jesus tells this church that you need to get back to that. You need to hold firmly to those things because those things matter. There are some other things that you can let go of that we can um, debate. And, and argue about and, and disagree about. But that list of things, that just simple list that, that I just, like, in, like, they're, we, like that's, those are basics. Look at what he says next, the, the next verse. Next part of verse 3. He says this. He says, to him, he says, you need to repent and turn to me again. You guys know what repentance is, right? Repentance is doing a 180. You're going in the wrong direction. You're, you're on the highway to hell. Somebody should write a song about that. Like, you're, you're, on, you're headed that, that direction, right? You're, as, you're going as fast as you can possibly go away from God. You don't want anything to do. You, you, you've rejected him. You've rejected his love. You reje you're, you're running in the wrong direction. And when you stop 
in your tracks and you turn around and you go the other way and say, God, I need you. You're the only thing that matters. All right, true repent. T- repent and turn back to me. And so what he tells the church at Sardis is you, you guys need to repent. There are some things that you need to, to confess, that you need to pray about, that you need to, that needs to be pointed out, that the Holy Spirit will point out in your lives and in your church, and you need to repent of those things. You need to turn from those things. You need to, to turn around, and you need to go the other direction. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, or it's quenched in a believer or in a church, then that church begins to lose life, and it begins to die. When we confess our sins, when we get right with one another, when we get right with God, then the Spirit infuses new life. And Jesus is saying there, there can be revival. There, there, there can be life again if you do these things. We need to confess our sins. We need to turn, and we need to go back in the opposite direction. And then look at what he says at the end of, of verse 3. He says, If you do not wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpectedly as a thief. He's saying, if you don't wake up, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be judged. I'm going to come, and, and I'm going to judge you. He says that he's going to, to judge those who aren't listening. He says, I am going to discipline you, and it's going to catch you by surprise if you don't wake up. And so the first three verses of this letter is a big warning sign. Danger ahead. Wake up. Turn around. Go the other way. I was uh, coming through town a couple weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago, and I was coming down Main Street. So it's like I was right there in front of like the theater and then kind of you know, where the bell house, you guys kind of know where all that. And I was coming this way to the office. And I noticed that a guy turned and was coming uh, toward me on Main Street. Now, you guys all know, you live here like that's one way. He ain't supposed to be doing that, right? And so I'm like, what is this guy doing? And so I stop my car, I start honking, right? I'm like, there's, I'm in front, there's like several cars behind me that are coming down. You know, we just got, we just got, you know, released from a red light and we're, we're all coming this way. And so I'm honking my horn, this guy's coming right at me. I'm honking my horn, I'm put, I stick my arm out the window, I'm waving my arm, right? I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Wake up, like you're going the wrong way. This is going to end very poorly for you and someone else. And then finally he, he saw me and he took off down the side road, right? But it's this idea that you're going the wrong way. And it's like, hey, wake up. Danger ahead. You're almost dead. It's like Jesus is looking at this church and these people. And he says, I can see the life just draining out of you. You're, you're, you're almost gone. It's almost over. I don't, I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not. But if you've ever stood at someone's bedside as they passed away, right? Maybe some of you have done that. And you've just said that you've just seen the life of someone just go out of them. They change color. It's just, right? You can just see them. If you've ever stood and just, I've, I've done this recently, just last fall with my father. I've done it with other loved, loved, loved ones. I've been in, in nursing home rooms, in hospital rooms. The moment someone's, someone passes away and the life is just gone, right? It's, it's over. And what Jesus is saying to this church is, guys, if you don't wake up, it, it's lights out. Like, it's, it's over. It's curtains. But he doesn't want that for them. He wants them to be stunned into the reality in which they're living. And the next three verses, the last three, like I told you, this, was, this letter is just six verses long. Those are the first three. And in the next three, he does give some encouragement to the— there's, there, there seems to be this small group of people in this church in Sardis that, that, that have kind of held to the, to the truth, that have held on to what Jesus wanted them to be. And so here's what verse 4 says. He says, yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. The word soiled here is from the Greek word, which means to stain or defile, to smear, to pollute. All right, you guys get it. Garments symbolize character. You might remember Dave mentioned uh, last, last week, um, 
purple and the color purple and how that represented someone who had wealth. And if they, when you wore purple, it, it represented a certain thing. Well, white represented something, obviously, as well. It re- represents purity. And so this small group, they had not allowed the world to pollute them to stain their character, Jesus says. This group, has, they're spiritually, spiritually alive. And there's only a few of them. They're a minority, but they're there. And we don't know if it's three or 30 or 300, but Jesus says, I know, I, I know, and I see you too. And I haven't forgotten you. I know that you guys are doing exactly what I, I've called you to do. And I, and I see that. And here's what he says next. He gives them a promise. Next verse, he says, They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. Now, this is interesting. Here's, here's something very... Remember I told you that Sardis was devoted to the, the worship of the mother goddess Artemis, right? And so there was all these horrible, detestable things that, that they were about, that, that their culture was about. One of the things that they did was when they would go to the temple to worship Artemis, the goddess Artemis, they had to... Um, they couldn't go in with any kind of... Uh, any, any kind of dirty clothes. Their clothes had to be com- uh, completely clean and pure. And so they would put on these white robes. And that was a signify that you were going to the temple to worship the goddess Artemis. And so what's happened here is Jesus is saying, hey, I know there's a bunch of people in your city who claim to be worshiping God or a goddess. But what I want you to know that, that you're going to stand with me one day. He's saying to them that you will walk with me in your white robes, not with these false gods. See, they had taken that image of of that white robe and they they defiled it. This was something that Jesus said, this this is a picture of purity, right? And they taken it and they made it something far less than that. Back in verse 2, Jesus said there's this, he's going to strengthen what little remains. He's talking about this small group of people, this faithful remnant. He says, I want you to fan into flames these embers that are still there. You guys have ever seen a a campfire that's almost out, right? And there's this little, kind of little glow and these little embers. And like, if you can kind of fan it or blow on it or like stoke it a little bit, maybe the flame will get going again. And that's what Jesus is saying to to these guys. Hey, you're still there. You're barely hanging on, but if we can fan these flames, right? If we can fan these flames, maybe we can take this dying church and bring it back to life. And then in verse 5, here's what he says. He says, I will never erase their names. Talking about this small group of people. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. What's he talking about here? Well, here's what happened. In the first century, in a lot of these cities, they had a registry, right? They would, when when a child was born, they would take and they would write their name in this registry. And so you were a a citizen of the city of Sardis, right? Now, your name was always in the book until maybe you did something wrong, you, you, got, you got arrested, you were in prison, you went to jail, you did something bad. And, and so they would say, okay, you've, you've given up, you forfeited your citizenship. They would take and they would erase their name from their book, from their registry. When someone died, they would say, all right, they're dead, they're gone, you know, remove their name. Right? And so there was this book, there was this registry of those who were citizens of the city. And so this group, Jesus is saying this. He's saying, I'm never going to do to you what your government has done to you. He says, I'm not going to erase your name out of my book. He promises them something very clearly. He says, because that they've showed faithfulness in the face of incredible pressure to turn away. Right? He's going to stand with them on the day of judgment before God. In, in the middle of, of everything that was kind of coming against them, right? Imagine living in this culture that like this is, this is what everybody's doing. This is what, what's happening, right? And so you're there and you're trying to follow Jesus in the middle of this wave of just evil and filth and, 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 and despicable stuff in the eyes of the Lord, and it's coming at you. We can't relate to that at all, can we? Right? It comes at us every day. It comes at you every time you pick up your phone. Right? And these people are in the middle of all this, and it's just coming at them all the time, over and over. And Jesus says, I've seen that you stood up under that pressure. I see that you've stood up 
under all of those circumstances. And I recognize that you're still with me, that you're still standing with him. You know, here's what he says. He gives them this promise that he's going to stand with him. He says this. He says, when, we stand, when you stand before God, when you stand before my Father, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, Dad, this one over here, he's with me. He's my friend. We, we go way back. He gets in. Dad, she, she, she's, she's been a follower for a long time. She's not perfect, but she's been faithful. She's never given up. And she stood up underneath all of this. She gets in. And so what Jesus says to this small remnant is, I'm not going to forget you on that day. You're going to get your reward. Be encouraged with that. And then the last thing he says, verse 6, he says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. And so here's how I want to close. Let's understand what Jesus is saying to the church. What's Jesus saying to the churches? What's he saying to our church? Well, here's the first one. Don't be a fake church. Right? You know when someone's fake, right? You can smell it. You can just sense it. Like, if you've ever been around somewhere like, I don't, I don't, this doesn't, this just feels weird. Like, they, I don't think they're totally legit. Like, you can, you can sense that. And people can, can sense and smell a fake church a mile away, right? When people put up a facade, when they put on airs, when they act like they're something they're not. And so let's not be a fake church. Let's be authentic. Here's the second thing. We need to wake up. We need to do what he's commanded us to do. Do what Jesus has commanded. He would say to the church, do what I commanded you. Do what I told you to do. If you just do it, right? If you would just be about my business. Are you guys ever, this happens in our house all the time. Like, we'll, we'll ask our boys to do something. We'll tell them to do something. And like, they'll, they'll like want to argue about it for like 10 or 15 minutes before they go do it. And my response is always like, dude, you could have done it three times in the 10 minutes you stood there and argued about it, right? Why don't you just shut your mouth and go do it, and then let's just move on. I'll, we'll all be happy, right? Just do what I tell you to do, right? A lot of times, I think Jesus just comes to us and he says, you need to wake up, and if you'll just do what I've commanded you to do, like, let's just let the, all the other chips fall where they may. You just do what I've called you to do, church. You do what I've called you to do, believer. And here's the third thing. We need to get back to the basics. We need to just kind of say, you know what? There are some things, there are some fundamental things that we need to be reminded of. Yeah, this is what's important. We need to get back to those things. That's what Jesus told the church at Sardis, and I think that's what he would tell us today. And the fourth thing is, we need to repent of our sins. We need to recognize that if there are things in our lives, if there's things amongst us as a, as a church that, that, that need to be pointed out by the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit uses someone else to point that out in your life, or you're just convicted by that, and you say, you know what? There are things in my life, there are sin in my life that I need to repent of, that I need to confess today, that I need to come clean with. I am heading down the wrong path in this area in my life, and I just need to say... I'm sorry. God, will you forgive me? I repent of those things. And I, I'm sure that as we wake up every morning, right, there are things that we say, God, forgive me. Thank you for loving me. All right? Thank you for uh, this specific thing. This, this is an area that I'm struggling with, God. You know my heart. Because He does know us. He says over and over, I see, I know, I know behind. You put up this thing. You have this reputation. You put up a facade. You put on a mask. But I know. And He says, just come clean. Let's talk about it. I'm your Father, and I love you. Repent of those things. And move on. And then the last thing as I think he would, would say to us today, have a burning passion for lost people. Have a, have a burning passion for people who do not know the Lord like you know him today. Be a church, right, that is about lost people, that is about people who are far from the Lord. Thankfully, somebody came along in your life, right, right? 
and cared about you enough to share Jesus with you or you wouldn't be here today. And so we are called, we are commanded. What Jesus says is you go and you do that for other people because that's what the church is about. And so let's have a burning passion for people who need to wake up, who need to repent, who need to turn, right? Well, let's, let's live lives that says, don't go that way, right? In a very loving, compassionate way, like that is going to end poorly for you. Can I share some truth with you in love? Will you walk with me this way? Can we turn around and go the other way, right? I bet you have people in your life right now, if I said, do you know someone like this? You'd, yeah, I've got, I work with a dozen of them, <laughs> right? He, he, I'll close with this. The city of Sardis, it was destroyed by an earthquake. Almost destroyed by an earthquake in, in uh, A.D. 17. And it said that the city never really fully dis, did, um, re- recovered from this earthquake. It recovered, but not completely, right? There were still a lot of issues that they had after this earthquake. And here's what's interesting when you think about the city of Sardis, up on top of this mountain, right? With these cliffs all around and these big walls, and only one way in and one way out that was easily guarded, right? What, what happened was they, become, they began com, become complacent, and they, they said, you know what? We're untouchable. And so they didn't really worry about much. But this earthquake hits. And, and, and where, does a, where does an earthquake come from? It comes from right underneath your feet, right? It was inside the city walls that they were attacked. It wasn't from an outsider necessarily or from something on the outside. It came from right within at their feet. And here's what's interesting about the church. The church thought, you know what, hey, we're, we're good. You know, the, the church at Smyrna, it was, uh, when well, I preached about that a couple weeks ago, they, they had a lot of out, outside you know, things that were trying to kill them. People were trying to persecute them and kill them. The church at Sardis really didn't have that. And, and, and they just, they saw that the things that were hurting them were from within. I, I, wor- I wrote these two words and I said, you know, here's the, the next slide. It says, the two things that will kill a church are complacency and apathy. Right? Complacency says, hey, we're good. We're good. Got the stuff I need here from my family. I like the service. It's tolerable. Like, it's only an hour a week. Like, I, I, got, I got these seats are pretty, com- like, everything's cool. Like, we're good. Like everything's going on. I, I, let's just kind of ride with this. I'm comfortable with everyone and everything. And when you just become, what happens when you com- become complacent? You start to die. You start to atrophy. You start to wither away. When you just sit down and say, this is comfortable, this is nice, right? It's not until you get up and get moving again that you're like, you know, you need to do that. And apathy says, what's apathy say in the church? You know what apathy says in the church? Apathy says, I know there's a bunch of people out there that if they die today, it's not good for them. Oh, well. To hell with them. That's what we say. That's what apathy says in the church. Apathy in the church says, oh well. I I don't mean to be coarse, but that's what we say to hell with them. Because that's, if we believe what the Bible teaches, that's where they're going to go. And so, this church at Sardis, Jesus looks at it and he says, you need to wake up. You need to repent. You need to turn. You need to go the other way. And I think what he would share with us this morning is something very similar. Maybe we need to wake up. Maybe we need to repent of the things that we're dealing with so that he can use us in a very powerful way. Right here in Shelbyville, Kentucky, with people who are far, far, far from God. And the one that he sent to them to share the good news of the gospel is you. It's you. It's this church. And here's the thing about this whole idea, this whole letter, this whole concept, is we get to decide. We get to decide what kind of a church we want to be. Because it's up to us. It's up to us. 
who we want to be and what we want to be about. Would you guys pray with me? Lord God in heaven, I thank you for today. I thank you for this, uh, this church. Thank you for those that are gathered here this morning. Thank you for the reminder in your word that at times it can be stark and it can be stunning and there's a reality and there's a cold splash of water in our face that just needs to wake us up because your business is urgent. Your, your, good, your, your message is the good news, but it's only good if people accept it. And so, God, you've called us, your church, to, to be deliverers of that message, to be heralds of that message, to be the mouthpiece for that message. God, use us in that way. Use this church in that way, in this community and around this world with our friends and neighbors and relatives and the people that we have relationships with every day. And God, my prayer this morning, is that if there's one person in this place today that doesn't know you, as Lord and Savior. If they don't know you as king of their life, they wouldn't leave this building today without having a conversation about that. We could pray with them and discuss with them and talk to them about how good it is to walk with you every single day. You are so good. You love us so much. Thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with me? We're going to sing this invitation song. If you have something you want to pray about or need someone to talk to, there will be some folks over at our decision room right over here to my right. We'd love to chat with you.
week. Maybe you need to have a wake-up conversation with somebody. I'm not suggesting you run up to them and yell in their face, wake up. That probably won't go well. But maybe, maybe you know what I'm saying? Maybe you need to, maybe God's put somebody on your heart. You know what? I need to, we need to talk. Maybe there's somebody that you need to talk with this week because you can't go another week with it on your conscience if you don't. I don't know. I bet there are a few of those out there percolating around. Have those conversations. Share that, that message with them this week. Hey, um, if you're new here, just checking things out, we'd love to connect with you out at the I'm New Wall. Stop out there before you leave today. we got a gift for you. For the rest of you guys, let's get out of here. Let's go love God. Hey, Shelby Christian. My name is Jordan, and here's what's happening on the Hill. We are all too familiar.